Greetings to everybody and welcome to SAFNOC 6 virtual conference. We're very excited to have everybody here today. And most especially, we'd like to thank our sponsors first before we go to anything. Um, we'd like to thank our sponsors. Our sponsors are Akamai, Flex Optics, Team Camry, and then on the those are our platinum sponsors. And then on the gold sponsors, we have one slide back, please. On our sponsors, we'd like to thank our platinum sponsors, Akamai, Flex Optics, Team Camry. And on our gold sponsors, we'd like to thank Africa Data Centers, ICANN, Internet Society, Work Online. And for our appearing sponsors, we have InkZA and Lynx. And of course, we could not do it without our community sponsors, NAP Africa. We'd like to welcome everybody and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, before we proceed any further, we'd just like to go through the housekeeping rules. This meeting is in webinar mode and it's being recorded. The recording will be made available after the meeting. We'd like to encourage everybody to please engage as much as possible with our speakers and of course with each other. Uh, but we'd like to ask that you please engage respectfully and responsibly. When speaking, please, or asking a question, please keep your questions short and simple and straight to the point. We have a Q&A function, which we would like to request that you please use specifically to post questions to our speakers. And of course, the chat function, you can use that to, uh, for general engagement throughout the conference. When you ask a question, you can ask it verbally or you can use the raise hand function after which you'll be queued uh, to answer a question. And this will happen after the speaker has completed uh, their presentation. Please do not hesitate to ask any questions if you need to ask, uh, please use the, uh, the chat function for that. Uh, but um, before we go too far, uh, I'd like to welcome the SAFNOC chairperson, Mark Tinker, to please say a few words um, and then we'll take it from there. Uh, thank you so much, Portia. Um, just want to say uh, a big thank you to everybody to, for taking the time uh, out of your busy schedules to join us for this session today. Um, we are trying something different this year because you know everybody is all zoomed out. So we just want to have two days of 90 minute sessions each so you can go back to being what's most important to you and you know again give us a few minutes of your day to, to go through uh, some, some topics for the year. Uh, but yeah, so really looking forward to, you know, uh, to the sessions um, and interacting with all of you all. Um, yeah, next slide. I just want to take a moment to, to recognize, for those of you who might not know, one of our you know, close friends uh, and members of the internet community, Susan Forney, who passed on earlier this month on the 8th of September. Uh, really sad. So our heart goes out to her family. Uh, and friends and our condolences um, for anyone that's, uh, you know, looking to donate, you know, pay tributes or anything of the sort, please visit that website, Memories of Susan of Org. Um, I'm sure it will be most appreciated. Um, just keep her and, uh, you know, and uh, family in your prayers and may she rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. We're not going to waste any more time. Uh, we're going to um, go on to our first speaker for the event. Uh, and our first speaker for today um, is Edrich Dulanga. He wears many hats, but today he's wearing the Inks hat. He represents Inks ZA. Ed? Hi there. Uh, right, we're just getting this presentation working. And as always, it's okay, playing the wrong one. Um, uh, nope. uh, you're on the correct one. In my yes. notes. Are you seeing the notes or the screen? I'm seeing the screen. Oh, yeah. Okay. So you're currently seeing a little boxy. Sorry. It's swapped it around from Nana. Anyhow, um, 
Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, for those who don't know, um, I'm the current chair um, of Inkzeda, uh, and I wear a couple of other community hats as well. Um, today, I will be sharing some of our well recent technological changes we've made around Inks and some things that are coming in the future. And if I can get the next slide to work, it would make my life a lot simpler. Okay. There's a standing joke in the Inks team that I'm not old enough to remember any of this that you're currently seeing. Um, so thank you to Greg Massel for documenting this so that people like me can find this 25 years later. Gosh, I have to be honest, I don't even recognize most of the names here. I'm sure that many of you in the audience could probably give me a better history lesson. Remember that in 1997, uh, this was pretty much all dial-up. Um, myself, I was in sub B or grade grade two, I think it is. Um, so I, <laughs> I wasn't even in the, the part of the community yet back then. Um, hell, I wasn't even technologically aware back then. Um, and yeah, if you remember the, the networks back then, uh, MUX cabinets with boards of dip switches uh, that you had to chain settings on and everything cost a lot, well, a lot more than they do nowadays. Um, and yet, even though this was a quarter century ago, uh, what was emerging even back then were a few simple truths that are very evident today. The South African ISPs were widespread. This might not seem like a lot, but I ask you to consider that this map is still larger than the number of ISPs in many other countries, uh, even today. And back then also, South Africa was already becoming a nexus point for interconnectivity. Um, if you're reading relatively closely, uh, you will see that the it's the Southern African networks here. So Zimbabwe, Botswana, Swaziland, well, now Eswatini, uh, just to name a few. And many of these places still hook back into South Africa today for network access. So, no. um, with a large number of ISPs in the market um, and being at the bottom of the world, well, you know the story from here. IXPs were being spoken about at network engineering level globally. Um, if you're wondering, IXPs started appearing in 1993 uh, and started trending in 1995. The newly formed ISPA held some meetings with various folks uh, and Jinx was formed. Four ISPs, the Internet Solution, which is now, I think, called the Dimen that's now merged into Dimension Data, UUNet South Africa, Global Internet Access, and SciTech were exchanging a staggering 256 kilobits worth of data by the end of the first week. Um, that was about 32,000 rands worth in 1996 or 1997, or roughly 200,000 rand in today's real money terms. I've heard someone ask Michelle to explain what the the time was for the return on investment for Jinx. And the answer was simple. It was less than a week. And less than a year later, the initial 10 meg switch was upgraded. Um, Nish showed this at a, another meeting, um, but I couldn't find any other definitive stats other than this 16 megs a second and a story from Ant Brooks presenting at AFNOG 1 in Cape Town when Jinx was at 40 megs. Anyhow, some old history. It was tempting to say things went smoothly from there. Looking back, listening to the war stories, I certainly think that we've abstracted away a lot of the, the learning lessons, things that you might say, what the heck were they thinking at the time, but which made sense at that time. And there's a long history of lessons learned that probably are more appropriate to people uh, that want to learn how to build an IXP um, what problems would could arise, um, and what to avoid, and how to sue your incumbent, etc. Um, and while I think that it's a really interesting history, uh, Mark asked that we speak a little bit about more of the technological things that we've been involved with recently. After all, this is a technology event, right? So as the saying goes, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And with the changes that have happened, both technologically and policy-based, I certainly think that Jinx and Sig and Dinx, in fact, Inkzeda as a whole, is in a much better position than it's ever been. But hey, I'm chair, so, well, I'm probably a little bit biased. And so I'll make just one more last parting comment on history. We are super proud to be 25 years old this year. Yep, 
this is our 25th year, somewhere in November, I think end of November, beginning December was the official starting date, which is up for debate, but yeah. Um, and we're amongst the 20 oldest operational IXPs in the world, which is no mean feat. But I think that being proud part is less about Jinx or ISPA or Inks. It's really more about a willingness of the community to come together and make something work for everyone. Most of those earlier pioneers are probably not here in the audience and probably not even going to listen to this talk. But the key lesson to us has got to be that we continue to cooperate for mutual benefit. And to steal one more parting line from Michelle, we compete at a commercial level, but cooperate at a technical level. And that's really the ethos that makes an ink a nog and makes a community work. Okay, I'm done being nostalgic. It's a universal truth. People want more of anything. So we need to progress beyond the, the point of having n times 10 gig links between our two primary sites. We were lucky enough to have received a donation of dark fiber from DFA. So the real issue became, how do we use this intelligently and reduce the, the future OPEX? Since we run a small, a small team, OPEX is a real big, a, a big change for us if it's not managed properly. So we could cater for the, the more peers at remote sites. In 2015, our community asked us to build a multi-site IX. And so we had slowly and expensively done so. Um, and that there were additional locations being built at that point um, and content coming from multiple of those locations uh, that it was going to require us to be more than just a simple extra site on various strings around the country or around town rather. But let's dial this back a bit. In 2014, we started building the multi-site architecture. We did this because our members asked us to do so. And the fun thing about a community run IX is you do what your community wants to. To build this, we went to the market to get quotes for transmission between different sites. And initially we thought 10 gigs would be fine for the larger sites, which seems like a reasonable call back then. <laughs> well, now if, if there's anything you know about South Africa, it's often that we have this last large disconnect in market pricing. My favorite quote from this period was one of the quotes that Michelle got. Um, the provider, bearing in mind, this was a large teleco, not a small mom and pop ISP, said that they couldn't sell us a 10 gig link and instead offered him a one gig circuit for around 190,000 Rand per month at the time. Um, at that time, this was around 16,000 US dollars for a one gig link. This is in a metro, needless to say that Telco didn't make it far past the first stage. But this is to whine about prices. As techies, we were constrained by cost. So um, with the model that they had, our team set out about implementing this. We were technology agnostic and the RFP for our switching was that we put out, that we put out to our vendors, didn't specify any particular technology type because frankly, we were more interested in mending our record high availability. And we felt that going um, with a vendor supported approach was the best. And the vendor supported approach was VPLS. And to get load sharing in place, they recommended creating multiple RSVPTE paths, which meant that that picture looked a lot more like this. Bear in mind that we needed to create entropy to get load sharing working. Simply having a single path was not enough. And we had to statically define each path. And let me say again, statically define each path. So what might look like a direct connection between two sites was actually a combination of something like eight paths between major nodes. And of course, tunnels are unidirectional. So that's 16 tunnels per device. And because those are static tunnels, it means mapping the path between each device and then mapping to the next node and then double checking each of these reverse paths back. There's something, there's some fantastic software that does this, but it was literally priced in the millions. So yeah. Us as a nonprofit couldn't quite do that. So we nailed load sharing. And fortunately, because the equipment just worked, it worked well. Um, and up until we needed to add new devices, which created its own config mess. And of course, we already had growth plans. Uh, I've put some of the switches in myself. So yeah, you can imagine this config was turning ugly really, really quickly. By the way, we did run into a, a one problem mid 2020. One tunnel, as you can imagine, one out of, well, many, many dozens, 
was not forwarding properly under very, very specific conditions when a circuit died and recovered. And yeah, debugging that, well, let's just say I'm glad it wasn't me having to fight with that for ages. And plus, we had other plans. So we knew that in the long term, we had to get rid of this RSVPTE. Honestly, the gear worked and it worked well. So we were not really interested in changing this. And frankly, as a nonprofit, the price was, price was right for us. We thought about the 400 gig gear because good engineers always consider alternatives. But when we did the pricing on the transceivers and thought very quickly that this was really just an academic exercise. So yeah. N times 100 gig it would be. And we'd wait a little bit longer until the 400 gig pricing dropped. Yeah, there's something to be said of not riding the bleeding edge of the technology wave on our budget. And why only have one when you can have two? Well, that was obviously a joke. But we care a lot about resiliency and uptime. So, of course, we need to be able to run services in parallel to ensure maximum uptime. Before I explain anything here, first, a huge shout out to Dark Fiber Africa. They stepped up and offered us Dark Fiber at no cost between our two core sites. I remember when Pranesh announced this at the INCS meeting, you know, it was a telecom. Um, and at, it was at this moment of silence that Nish said like, sorry, could you repeat that again? Because we were all sort of quite surprised because um, this was not something we were prepared for, to be honest. So this was a fantastic gesture coming out in support of our community because they wanted to support many community initiatives um, and they saw the benefit that this provided to the local market. And I think more networks were starting to appreciate the long-term benefits of us going multi-site. At any rate, we did the math, the physics worked, so this looked doable. But then some of our members of the tech team were too excited about using multi-lane, so LR4, 100 gig optics on distances more than 40 kilometers. One of our team members, Hayrian, if you're here, uh, had done some extensive testing of PAM4 transceivers, leveraging his testing and using this as the basis to qu uh, quiz the prospective vendors. Um, and that was an, a fantastic starting point for us. It saved us quite a bit of time. So while this worked on paper on distances beyond 40 kilometers, this was a strict no-go. And even the vendor at that point was reticent to offer this as a solution when we started the process. Our model for operation is to be OPEX light, and we don't like fiddling with things that are working. So frankly, we believe in a strict do it right the first time policy. Well, when budget permits. Um, and we wanted to do something that was going to just work. When we discussed alternatives with friends, colleagues, and even other vendors in the industry, we were quite certain that we were not going to try and build a single large photonic domain. Not that this is bad, it just requires considerable more expense and time and upkeep, more than us trying to have a to light a point-to-point -point Faber or a data center interconnect, as the industry has come to call it. As much as it might as seem to be the case, this was not really about us wanting to having wanting to have newer and fancier gear. As you likely know, there's technolo technological limitations on what is possible with distance and high-speed fiber. As mentioned, some of the volunteers on our committee um, have helped to build large scale networks and explicitly warned us against trying to use the PAM4 transceivers on long paths. And we were not seeing general availability of 100 gig single wave ZR type transceivers yet. Well, what can I say? Running the IX has now become quite a bit more complicated than just making sure the switches and the data center are powered and worked. The key strength for us was we had a dedicated and knowledgeable volunteer was always willing to share their experiences and not uh, shy about holding vendors accountable. Imagine having a set of network engineers sharing their experiences, problems, and solutions, all working to together to build a better common platform. And let me be honest, the network that I personally work for um, is only now starting to roll out our own dark fiber solutions, but I've learned a lot from these engagements and experiences that I can truly say that my own network has benefited tremendously from the participation in links and the lessons learned. And so um, after all that, uh, we agreed that a coherent WDM solution was needed between these sites. Um, it would be, it would still be some risk attached to it, of course, even though we took pains to painfully trace out the entirety of these fiber paths, but thank you, Graham. Um, 
there have been cases where there have been dual fiber breaks between these sites on their, their core routes. And at least one senior net op has seen the uh, uh, complete path failure from a single supplier. But we were playing with a non-profit deck, so making do with what we had. Um, for those looking at the current picture and wondering what's going on, um, basically we had four core switches in place with uh, the idea was to have two pairs of WDM gear that would each be able to run 500 gig capacity across um, the single fibers and then would uplink to our core switches over 500 gig ports each. So there's quite a lot of bandwidth involved there. So that, you know, making sure it stays up is very important. And we didn't want to have any repeaters in between um, requiring us to maintain another site of the gear. So it was the simplest solution. And in the long run, we think quite the cost-effective solution for what we required. That slide, slide isn't entirely correct. It is true to say that we wanted to trans we wanted transport provider resiliency, but what we were planning for um, with the deployment of the first two DWDM, sorry, when we were planning for the deployment of the first two DWDM circuits, another dark pipe provider stepped in and offered us another two paths. So thank you, Link Africa, for providing us with the second set of completely diverse paths. So if you're keeping score here, we've gone from a few lit 10 gig circuits to four completely diverse dark fiber paths that are both provider diverse and geographically diverse. Yes, I do still pinch myself sometimes. However, the challenge here is that we're pretty close to wanting to deploy the infrastructure and there was no ways we could afford another complete set of dark fiber gear. We spent the time and found a solution that was close to plug and play as you can imagine. And as I said, since we liked to be OPEX light, outfitting equipment for four circuits was looking to like looking like it would cost us a lot more than we could afford. So eventually we found the nifty alternative, a fiber, a fiber protection module, an FPU, that was being capable, that was capable of being deployed as a standalone one U device, completely passive. Um, so if you remove the power, but capable um, of external management, so you can still see what's happening at a line level. And yes, they worked as advertised. My dirty secret is that the first weekend it went in, I had to manually swap the protection path to just make sure everything worked fine. Sorry, Nesh, but I don't think you, that you even noticed it. So you have it, two independent systems with independent protected capacity, each with provided resiliency, allowing us to keep sleep well at night, allowing our peers to retain their high expectations of things. Hi Ed, but, just to let you know on the time. Hi Ed, just to let you know time. Um, you've got a few minutes remaining before your Q&A. We'll give you three perfect. minutes. That's cool, perfect. Um, but we were not quite done yet. Remember, we've got that mess of spaghetti driven RSVPTE that we wanted to resolve. And when we needed to do that before we added in new switches, but hold on. Uh, we needed to add new switches so we could get the 100 gig ports so that we could get content into the other facilities. So interconnect more switches and then the code does what you need to do. It wasn't quite in production yet ready yet. So, so of course, this was never easy. Um, if the slides feel like a mess and if you've spotted the hidden headache in the middle, it's honestly because this is pretty much how we felt at the beginning of the year, at least from a, a networking engineering perspective. Um, I'm going to shorten this a little bit to just catch up because I'm clearly going longer than anticipated. Um, but uh, we decided early uh, in the process in the year that we were going to move from a VPLS uh, system that um, was originally required re recommended to a VXLAN based solution. But since we use something called PS tags, uh, which is basically VLAN rewrites, which was not supported by our vendor uh, and the code. Um, at that point, and it only became stable at the end of March, we weren't quite going to just jump into that boat. Um, so we went to the, the, the middle ground, which was LDP, because it's a nice auto discover solution for your network, but it meant that we could not, we would not be able to do any sh sort of load sharing. But since we suddenly had a lot of bandwidth capacity, capabilities, that was no longer required. Um, so in a very short period, um, we got quite a bit done. And this is mostly because uh, we have a very detailed internal wiki um, that was driven by our grumpy IXP manager who believes this key to success is planning. 
I mean, literally, we have lists of lists with tick boxes. And yeah, um, to say that he's overly fanatical about checklists is an understatement. But um, this time around, it was really helpful. And we completed the migration earlier this year, and we did the bulk of the work over two nights. And we're willing to bet you didn't even notice the short two second outage. I can assure you your BGP sessions didn't. Um, there are some projects we're going to do in the future, um, including some monitoring solutions um, and uh, our RTP, our uh, bl uh, traffic black holing solution, but I don't think I'm gonna have time to get to all of that. Um, so lastly, I just want to say thank you to all our sponsors who make it possible for us to work with big net, well, with Give that makes our network big and stable. Um, so yeah. Um, and then, yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, you can contact us on any of those details, uh, or you can ask a question now in the Q and A session. Um, and yes, that's just one of the maps map spots for Jinx because, well, we couldn't list everything in in one nice screen. So yeah, if there's any questions, great. Thank you so much, Ed. Uh, that was very, very, very great. Um, so we have a question from Chwene Simono, and he says, greetings. I am Chwene Simono, I'm a relations manager from Number Resource Society. Can I please have a copy of the presentation? <laughs> of course, you'll be able to get that um, after, after the meeting. We'll upload that. Um, is there any other questions from, um, from the participants that you'd like to ask Edric before he goes off? We still do have a little bit of time. You can raise your hand or you can send the question in the Q&A. Okay, there doesn't seem to be any questions thus far. Thank you so much, Ed. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, so our next speaker is going to be Amrish from ISOC, um, he will be presenting. He'll be presenting to us um, alongside with his colleague. Um, but before we before we go in there, let's just make sure that we are we have him on the screen. There we go. If you could please go into presentation mode. So Amrish will be presenting with uh, with Kevin. Um, they'll do a switch when they need to. Uh, welcome, Amrish, and thank you. Um, you can go ahead. Thank you, Porsha. Um, hello, everyone. So my name is Amrish Fukia. I work for the Internet Society. And it's a pleasure, renewed pleasure for me to be at SAFNOG again. Uh, I think I haven't missed SAFNOG since the beginning. Um, so today, um, I'm going to talk about a framework that we are building with um, a few partners, including Afrenic, called the MIRA framework. MIRA standing for Measuring Internet Resilience in, in Africa. Um, yeah, as mentioned, uh, we have different partners working on this project, including Afrenic, and we are also working with a few academic partners um, because it is a research uh, it is a research project uh, on which they have helped us working, for example, with the theoretical framework and the internet measurement aspects uh, of internet resilience. And together with them, we have published a document called the. Uh, the Mira project overview, which you can find uh, if you go on this link, which you can see on the on the slide here. So um, to introduce you to the topic, um, I'm sure you must be hearing quite often now something called meaningful connectivity. So of course, these days, especially in this time of a pandemic, uh, it, we, we cannot only afford to have just an internet connection. So the internet connection needs to be fast and some, somehow it, ne it needs to be uh, unlimited because if you have a cap, a cap connectivity, for example, if um, you are on a mobile data package, of course you cannot do whatever you would like to do, especially watching educational videos uh, for lengthy hours. And of course you need to have uh, an appropriate device. And Unfortunately, this is not the case um, in Africa because there are regions in Africa which are very well connected 
uh, but other regions which are, which are not very well connected. And this is what we are going to look at in this, in this framework. So the reality is, as you know, um, you have cable breaks. For example, uh, last year we had the wax cable that had a breakdown and uh, connectivity in South Africa, for example, was, um, was disturbed. Um, load shedding is, is quite a fre frequent occurrence um, uh, in South Africa. And, and my friends um, can, can tell you about um, how disturbing this can be. Um, and of course, not all networks have the same level of redundancy and resilience so that they can actually um, have the same level of, provide the same level of experience to, to the end users. So how do we measure all this? We came with an idea, which we call the Internet Resilience Index, whereby um, we know out there, we have so many very rich data sets and we can conduct our own measurements as well. But what if we put all together, all these different indicators and metrics and, and try to compute um, an index? So the index for us here is just simp a simple composite indicator, or you can call it an aggregated score that measures a, country, a country's performance against the key pillars of a robust internet ecosystem. So what are the key pillars? So in the model that we have defined together with our different partners, we have infrastructure as a very important model. So think of infrastructure as the cable ecosystem. What is the state of mobile connectivity? Do, do, you have, do we have enough coverage um, in, in a country or, or in a specific region of a country? And what are the enabling infrastructures? So is there an IXP present? Um, in that country, uh, do we have data centers, so on and so forth. Then we looked into performance. So performance, as you know, is, is also important. Um, so we, we looked at both fixed networks and, and, and mobile networks. So we looked into uh, the, the, the bandwidth, uh, upload and download, and also the latency to, 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 the, to the speed test servers so that we have an indication of performance um, in, in, a, in a specific region. And then we have, of course, everything that enables uh, the, the internet ecosystem to be robust and also secure. So for example, we would want to have um, the CCTLD domain of a country to be signed. Uh, we would like them to uh, adopt a routing best practices such as manners and also um, we would like to know what is the state of the infrastructure. Is it good enough or is it secure and actually becoming a potential threat to other countries? And finally, but I think also very important is uh, the, 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 the state of the local ecosystem, the market readiness. So you might have a very good infrastructure, but what if it is not affordable? What if it is very easy to, to control the system and also, and also uh, shut down the internet? Because in our region, we have seen in many cases, um, governments shutting down the internet because it is very easy. You just need to contact one operator and ask them to, 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 to stop all the BGP sessions or mangle with the DNS and then that's it. The whole country is down. So to do this, we, as mentioned, we have to collect data from many places, but not every type of data. The data need to be relevant, of course, it needs because relevant to the indicator or metric that we are trying to um, include in our model, it needs to be accurate. Um, so we need to know the methodology behind and how the data was um, collected and also maybe treated to remove any sort of impurities such as outliers. Uh, coverage, coverage is important. Uh, we cannot have a, a good indicator if let's say half of the countries that we are going to measure resilience is not present. Um, so it, it's very important to have good coverage um, of the indicator for all the countries. And, 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 and as well, for all the countries, we also need to have a good number of indicators. Let's say we have only three indicators, that's, that's not good enough for us to, to build um, a proper framework. And of course, timeliness. Um, 
whenever we, we calculate such an index, we need fresh data. We cannot afford to have data, which is like five years ago. So let's now do a dive into the different indicators for each of the pillars that I have mentioned. So first of all, for the cable ecosystem, we are going to look into the number of international gateways. So this, for example, um, uh, a country, the most countries, they have international gateways because they need to route traffic outside of that country. Um, so island countries would have cable, sta cable landing station or the coastal countries would have cable landing station. But that's not necessary. That's not the case at all for landlocked countries. They they might have, or as we will see, they some of them do not have actually cross border connectivity. Some might be relying on a visa connection only, and and this is and this is a problem. We are going to look at the num the, the percentage of the population which uh, as close as ten kilometers to a fiber point of connection. Um, and then also, as I mentioned, power availability is important. What's the purpose of having internet connectivity if you don't have power at all? Or if power is, is, is intermittent, then your experience as the end user is, is not great as well. We look at um, mobile connectivity, network coverage, and spectrum allocation. So this data is coming from the GSMA. And as mentioned, enabling infrastructure, we will we are computing the number of IXPs, the number of data centers that are present in the country. Performance, as I mentioned, uh, we looked at fixed networks, both fixed networks and mobile networks, looking into the median upload and the median download and median latency. And the good thing is that we, we do not need to go and do the measurements ourselves because this is large scale data and we rely on crowd source information such as Ookla, which has a very rich data set of all the speed tests that were done um, around the world. And it was very easy for us to extract, to extract the countries that we are actually doing the measurements and also aggregating them to find the median download, upload or, or latency. In terms of enabling tech and, and, and security, we looked into the, the percentage of IPv6 adoption, the percentage of websites in the country which are using HTTPS, because this is important now, DNSSEC validation and DNSSEC adoption. So DNSSEC um, is, is the resolvers in the country actually validating the, the, the DNS queries. Um, so this is important. Routing hygiene. Um, so at ISOC, we, we like to promote manners, which includes a set of practices, for example, filtering, coordination, global validation using the routing registry or RPKI. So all this together, we have created something called a manners score, which we inject now in this model. We have other data sets on security, for example, the number of secure internet servers coming from the World Bank, the Global Cyber Security Index from the ITU, DDoS potential from CyberGreen and spam infection from spam hosts. So DDoS potential would give you like the likelihood of a country to, to become a threat to other countries. And spam infection is what is the percentage of networks that have been seen on a, on a block list, for example. And finally, the local ecosystem and market readiness. Um, we have data about affordability coming from the ITU. Um, two things that we have actually calculated is market concentration and AS hegemony. Market concentration is how, how skewed is, is the market. So is there like a dominant um, operator that has most of the eyeballs in a country? So think about, think of a country like Ethiopia or Eritrea is, is very, um, the market is very concentrated towards um, single networks. AS hegemony is a little bit different where here we look at the, the average number of paths going through a group or a few operators only. And this gives us another, another insight about the inequality of distribution in terms of path that a network networks can use to, to reach the internet. 
Traffic localization is important. So we have been talking a lot about the use and importance of IXPs, how to create traffic local. Um, so we look into peering efficiency, for, for example, looking at how many of the local ASNs are peering in a country. Um, we have information about the domain count um, and uh, e-government e -government development index is actually an interesting proxy because it gives you an indication of how developed the e-governance um, ecosystem is in the country. So the, the, the more developed it is, the higher the index and it shows like more activities on the, on the local level. So when building an index, you have, to, you have to assign weights to the different indicators and dimensions, and you have different ways to do that. You can, you can see the, using statistical methods, you can see the relationship between the different indicators. But the way we decided to do that is more on a qualitative approach and survey uh, through surveys. So um, when we started the project, we gathered expert opinions, expert, the experts being, they can be network operators, they can be policy makers. Um, and each, each of these people or the different groups of people would give their, their weights, their, their weightage to, to, to the different dimensions and, and pillars. And we transcribe that into our model to, to calculate the final index. So the way we do that, so we use a simple, um, I call it, or we call it weighted sum, uh, where we will mu multiply the, the first of all, of course, we need to normalize the indicators, then we multiply it by the weights, and then we, we just add them together. And this gives us the internet resilience index. So we have built a proof of concept. Um, so if you go on this URL, tinyurl.com slash internet dash resilience dash index, uh, you will find our proof of concept where you can actually see the state of internet resilience in Africa. So this, this, this project in the, in the first phase is focusing on Africa. So that's why you will have information about Africa only, but in the future, uh, early next year, actually, we, we plan to expand it to different other regions of the world. So you, you can go on the website and you, will, you can select countries, you can select different countries, um, and then you can compare them between each other. You will see the, the score that they have received um, for each of the pillars and, and, and the dimensions as well. And you, you can see the ranking and you can um, actually sort the country uh, per, let's say you are interested in, in, in infrastructure, you want to see who is, who is top or last um, for the infrastructure or performance. Yeah, uh, so a quick analysis. So we have seen that um, on average, landlocked countries have lower internet resilience. So if you see, um, the, for example, Central African Republic or Niger, here they, they have lower, lower internet resilience than let's say coastal countries such as South, South Africa, Kenya, or, or Morocco. And looking into more detail, we see that, for example, uh, Central African Republic, they do not have any uh, active cable infrastructure or cross fiber connectivity. So that could be a problem. So the, this is just, just the fourth, first part of the project. We're also working on another aspect of the project, which is based on active measurements. And for this, what we are doing is we are provisioning Raspberry Pis, which we call Mirapods. And um, using a system which, is, which allows us to centrally control those devices, we, we deploy measurement code. And the measurement code can be, can be varied. It can be measurement code that we build ourselves or measurement code that exists already. For example, we can deploy a RIPE Atlas software probe on these devices. So right now we have around 30 of these devices connected in a, in a few countries, in a few African countries. And thanks to that, we are conti con continuously monitoring aspects such as bandwidth um, and latency. And in the future, we can run, um, you know, custom measurements. Um, so uh, what we have in plans right now, we are going to run a study on DNS measurements. So trying to see, for example, DNS resolution 
from, the, from these different countries. In terms, this is the data pipeline, just a schematic diagram of how things are, are connected between one another. So um, down there, you have all the small devices collecting the data. So these can be ripe, ripe atlas probes. These can be MLAB devices or Mirapods collecting data, sending it to, to ripe atlas um, central database or MLAB center, central database. And then our data pipeline will collect the data, uh, the data that we are actually interested in, merge it, sorry, merge it with, uh, with secondary data that we have been collecting, for example, BGP data. And then we have an analytics pipeline that clean the data, treat the data, um, and also normalize it so that we can visualize it on, on the dashboard. So the data that you are seeing on the dashboard is data that has already been processed and, and, and cleaned. So the technologies we are using, um, we are using Balena, which is a, a IoT cloud management platform, which allows us to manage devices um, centrally, uh, remote devices, um, which means that we can actually um, spin up a device or spin up a, a, a container um, easily uh, from, from a central location. And right now we're using Google Cloud to, to, to save our, the data being collected and using BigQuery, Google BigQuery to, to manipulate the data. Um, we have also been building a dashboard to see the data that we are collecting from the Mirapods. Um, it's not public yet because it's still uh, under development. So the, the, the dashboard basically allows us to, to get almost real-time information about first, the status of the devices, whether they are online or offline, and uh, also um, what are the what are the the metrics that they are collecting. So, for example, here you can see download, upload, and, and minimum latency. So the idea eventually is to put all the data on the Internet Society Pulse uh, platform. So, if you're familiar with the Pulse platform. Um, you can just navigate to pulse.internetsociety.org and there you will have information about different focus areas. Uh, we have, for example, showing here where there have been the latest shutdowns happening. We have information about, we have, yeah, information about the technologies such as TLS adoption and HTTPS adoption. So our, our, our data, the Internet Resilience Index is going to go in the, the resilience focus area of the Pulse website. I would invite you to have a look at this website. It, it has quite a lot of information. So what, what next for, for Pulse? So we intend to release the Internet Resilient, Resilience Index uh, soon. Uh, this is happening next month or, or hopefully before the end of the year. Um, and also, we we would like to make the data available um, because we would like anyone to actually use the data and visualize it the way they want. So the 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 raw data will be available, not the raw data that we are collecting collecting ourselves, but the raw data that we have used to calculate the index will be made available to to the public. Um, some sort of interactive dashboard would be quite interesting. So let's say you are you are a policy maker uh, or you are a regulator you are mostly interested about um, the um, the policy aspect or you're let's say you're interested into performance and then maybe you would you would add more weight because we mentioned that we, we can assign weights to the indicators you would add more weight for example to performance and that interactive interactive dashboard would allow you to assign weights uh, to to the to, to the model. We are expanding partnerships with other regions. So uh, our ne next focus early next year will be with the Caribbean regions. They have expressed interest to, to replicate this, our methodology there. So we are working with them. And we are also working very closely to, with the measurement lab, um, which has provided their, their tool called Murakami, which is basically uh, a tool that can be installed on these Raspberry devices to perform speed test measurements. And of course, um, 
as and when needed, we will add new measurements to, 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 the, um, to the platform. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have questions, uh, I'll take them. Thank you so much, Amrish. And uh, we do have a question, but before we do that, uh, firstly, I'd like to apologize to Ed and everybody, we forgot to run his uh, speaker rating poll. We'll run it after this. Um, so we'll have a speaker poll that we'll be running now as we do the Q&A for Amrish. Okay, so um, Amrish, we've got a question from, um, give me a second. Oh, seems to be an answered. Okay, Kevin has answered the question. Uh, the question was from Eric, who was asking if reunion is not going to be a part of the resilience study. So um, the response to that from Kevin is, hi, Eric, it is included in the study. The back end is not 100% done. We will have that checked, thanks. Um, I don't know if you'd like to add anything on to that. Yeah, Rinyan, uh, uh, we haven't included Rinyan in that, in that dashboard yet because um, we, we, we are going to focus on African countries first. So Rinyan, for example, will fall under France. So we, we intend to do that whenever we expand on, on Europe, for example. Okay. We don't seem to have any other questions, but there's still time. Um, if anybody has a question for Amrish, please feel free to either raise your hand and then you can ask it verbally or you can still send a question through to the Q&A. Okay, I don't see anything coming through there. Okay, thank you so much, Amrish. If anybody asks a question, you, you will be able to, uh, to respond uh, through the... Oh, there's something, there's something, okay. Thank you, Bushar. We have a question. We have a question from Hitham. He says, on the Africa map, I noticed that the internet resilience in Egypt, similar to Libya and Somalia, is similar to Sudan, while the infrastructure are not the same in similar countries. And also the AXPs are not similar in these countries. I guess it's a comment. Yeah, uh, so these are, these are, I would say, the artifacts that we have when collecting large amounts of data. And uh, perhaps there are data gaps, things that we have collected some in one place and not in other places. So all these uh, artifacts, we will analyze them and then try to, um, try to yeah, um, um, remove them from the, from the model. Um, but it can also, in some of the cases, reveal some interesting insights about maybe something which is not working in Egypt, for example. So it is, um, it is an area of exploration. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Um, let me see if we have any other questions from anyone. There doesn't seem to be any other questions. Thank you so much, Amrish. We appreciate it. Sure. Okay. So we're going to close the polling for Amrish and we will now do the polling as we go into a short break. We'll also do a polling for, for Ed. Um, apologies for that again. We'll run the poll again just um, for Ed. If you could please rate him. We will be having a short break between uh, now and the top of the hour. Uh, before we go into the break, we'd like to thank our sponsors once again, uh, Akamai, Flex Optics, Team Kamri, Africa Data Centers, ICANN, Work Online, Internet Society, um, Inc ZA, Lynx, as well as NAP Africa. We appreciate your support so much. Without you, this meet meeting would not have been possible. Um, we're going to just take a short uh, body break and then hopefully um, everybody will be ready for the next uh, speaker at right at the top of the hour. Once everybody's done rating Ed's talk, please feel free to just take a moment to get to refresh yourself, get a glass of water and we'll be back right at the top of the hour.
and welcome back everyone. Um, this is going to be our next session and we're not going to take too much time uh, before going in there. We're going to go dive right in. Um, for our third speaker today, we have um, Frederick Korsbeck and Frederick is going to be telling us to mind our manners. Um, so Frederick. Thank you very much, Portia. All right, hopefully my screen is visible. Um, uh, yes, your screen is visible. However, your audio is not that uh, audible. Uh, maybe a bit more volume, perhaps. Like that? That sounds much better. That sounds better. All right, excellent. All right, my name is Freddy Korsbeck. I'm a senior technical uh, business developer for IP and Interconnect, or BGP guy for short. I work for Amazon Web Services, which is known as AS16509 in the default free zone. Um, so today we will talk about three different things, so three main topics. So uh, first we'll talk a little bit about manners, uh, and it's great here to kind of follow suit after someone from ISOC, because uh, manners is an ISOC initiative. Uh, we will talk a little bit about AWS and RPKI, and a little bit of AWS and routing security, kind of where we're going and kind of where we see, um, you know, where, where we're heading. Um, so just a quick primer, I guess this is not, not really news for anyone, but uh, you know, we have routing, uh, routing incidents happening all the time, uh, hijacks that causes outages or you know, even problems in terms of stealing data and those kind of things. Um, there is both attacks, real attacks, someone trying to destroy something or steal something, uh, but it's just simple mistakes. They, they happen, probably most of them are simple mistakes. Um, and these are cascading problems and uh, a small config mistake can cause big outages, uh, even if that was not the intention. Um, so you've probably seen a couple of these. These are headlines from different press all over the world. There is like these old, old school ones, you know, that where YouTube got redirected to Pakistan for a few hours. Um, we have things that has happened to ourselves as well. For example, we had a hijack. Uh, that uh, affected Route 53, which is our DNS service, which was which was not good. Um, and you know, this the things comes up in in, in like regular uh, modular media occasionally. So so it is a real problem for sure. And and these things can take anything from a few seconds to to see to even months. Like we have seen hijacks that's been that's been um, you know been at place, but no one has really noticed uh, because of multiple reasons. So. So, so these take uh, the shape, many shapes, right? Uh, which is which is also, I think, a bit scary. So manners is kind of one of the things we can do, or rather one of the uh, initiatives that are trying to do something about this. And manners is short for mutually agreed norms for routing security, uh, and it's an ISOC initiative. Um, today, actually, this slide is a little bit outdated because because for me, like I believe three weeks ago, there's actually a fourth uh, category here or a fourth program, which is for vendors, but given that I don't think there's a lot of vendors here tonight or this evening, uh, I don't think it's very relevant for us. So let's talk about the three big things, which are network operators, which is internet exchange points and uh, content delivery networks and cloud providers, which is what I'm representing here today. So looking at, at, at the managed actions for network operators. So these are kind of like, you know, um, actions or standards that, that operators that believe in this should, should uphold. So there is filtering, which is pre prevent pre propagation of incorrect running information. There's the anti-spoofing part, which is to make sure that your customers cannot use IP addresses that they were not allocated. There's a the coordination bit, which is to be able to help each other uh, uh, to get contact information and to be able to, you know, get in contact with each other to solve problems. And then there is the global validation, which is to publish data of some sort so that others can do successful filtering um, uh, to help you and to help each other. Also, all of these are mandatory actions which you need to kind of perform to be able to validate on this. Um, looking at, uh, at Southern Africa specifically, uh, the, uh, there is uh, interest in this, of course. This is not a comprehensive list, but the ones that I could that I could find uh, on a quick search on the Manners webpage. So there is uh, a whole bunch of them in South Africa. Uh, there is uh, CECOM that's sponsored here today, I believe, UbuntuNet, Mozambique, uh, uh, the MoreNet, so the Research Education Network in, in Mozambique. Uh, in Angola, uh, I found three different operators. And there's a couple of ones that kind of span multiple continents and these kind of things. So, so this is great. 
Um, uh, the network operator program is by far the biggest one. It's also the oldest one from Manners. It's been going on for a few few years actually. So uh, there's absolutely interest in this region, which is great. Uh, I would definitely like to see more as well throughout the African continent, of course. Uh, that that has interest in this and that understands and 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 know what to do with this. Uh, there's always help available from the Manners Initiative. We have both something called Manners Fellows and Manners Ambassadors, which I believe a few of them are here today. Even uh, I'm an ambassador myself, uh, so I kind of do my ambassador work here, uh, speaking to you guys. Um, so there's always people available that can help out and kind of you know dive deep on what these things actually means. So like, what does filtering mean and how do you do it successfully? Uh, same with anti spoofing and coordination and validation. So I will not go into detail exactly how to do it or how to kind of uh, um, uphold the standards here, uh, but there is tons of documentation, tons of, of uh, help available um, to kind of, you know, understand what you need to do um, on a bigger scale, which I think is great, which is kind of what we're trying to achieve. Um, Internet Exchange Points, the same thing. So that program was started a few years ago. Um, it's mostly around route servers because that's how kind of uh, security can be applied in the sense of an Internet Exchange Point. Um, so, you know, an IXP is also community, right? So the community around an IXP is extremely important. One might argue it's one of the most important things an IXP has to kind of, you know, has to do uh, to build a local community of people that like to peer. Um, so, um, you know, then action two here, uh, I think is, is uh, important for IXPs to kind of understand what they can do. Um, and, um, action one is on the route server. So that is to make sure that your route server doesn't leak, uh, or, or, or help to do hijacks, uh, which I think is great. There is tons of really good software available that, that, the IXPs can run to, to help out with this. Um, and a, a lot of things that's been happening in this sector, I would say the last three years, uh, and, and the, the uplift is, is great uh, on this all over the world. IXPs has been really good and probably the fastest ones uh, to, to get these, these things into place, which I think is great. Um, so uh, looking at Africa, NAP Africa is part of this. Um, I, I, I don't know if any more around this scene is, 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 is part of this, but um, uh, there's, there's always a room for more here, uh, which I think is great. Um, so, so this list is, by the way, available on the Manners website if you would like to look in your specific country or any other country, uh, kind of which, which uh, organizations is available and what they do. Uh, the last part is, I guess, the ones that, that for example, uh, I was part uh, to, to build together with, with other colleagues from the CDN Cloud business. Um, so the founding members were Google, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, Akamai um, and uh, a few others um, that was part of ta ta taking this to the next step that would also suit the needs for, for cloud and CDNs. So it is basically the same as the network operators. Um, um, and and um, Action 5, I guess, is a new one that we also try to encourage uh, as well. And we have a, a non mandatory action as well in terms of Action 6. Uh, which is, if possible, you know, that we somehow can help to showcase uh, through our peering platforms or through portals that um, uh, if there is something that's bad is happening or why we're blocking routes, for example, I guess is the, the one that people have been commonly asking about. Um, uh, so this is something that we do. All right, so if we kind of switch tracks, go over to the RPKI bit, kind of where we are today. So. Uh, since I'm, I'm deeply interested in RPKI and, and have been part of the AWS team on how RPKI should work and what we should do with it, uh, basically from day one. Um, so kind of where we are today is that we are dropping RPKI and Valid in 100% in of our Internet Edge border. Uh, we have about 250 or so uh, global pops. Uh, and all of these has on all sessions, peering or transit alike, doesn't matter. All of these are dropping all invalid routes. Um, we uh, do not do anything with unknown routes, uh, which is the best current practice. Really, there is, there is nothing sensible we can do with those routes as it stands today. Uh, so we do not deep prefer them or anything else. So, so valid and unknown is, is essentially handled the same way. Uh, today, we have signed about 98% of our announced IP space. 
the two percent that's still left is uh, typically Brazil and uh, a little bit in China uh, that we have not been able to, um, you know, get all the automation in place to uh, successfully sign all that space. Um, today, kind of how it works that we have around RUA, RUA renewals. So we do them basically on a six weeks basis. Uh, we have really short lived certificates on all our space. Um, we have something which is, resembles an IP vending machine almost internally, uh, which means that every internal team that needs IP addresses for a service, um, they, they, they buy it from the vending machine. And then the vending machine takes care of the IRR records and the ROA certificates and make sure that they're up to date, that they are renewed. And if the services are not used anymore, they get pulled back um, to kind of protect us and everyone else. And we need, which we're always trying to stay as true as possible with the prefix length to whatever the service is supposed to do. So if it is uh, slash 16 and it's not supposed to uh, be, um, be short on any, anything more, we will try to keep it with some, you know, there is, we still need to be able to do like remote trigger backhaul and these kind of things. So depending on what type of service it is, we try to keep it as tight as possible to kind of have full functionality of, of the RPKI ecosystem. Um, so for us also RPKI in general uh, is uh, it's a severity, severity one service, which means that it's part of our own call teams. Uh, we have them on rotation 24 seven. It's, it's something that if it's not working, everyone is hands on deck for sure. Uh, just as, you know, a backbone links or anything else would be. So it is not something we do just because it's fun or just because Job Schneider said that we had to do it right. It's something that we truly believe in and, and something that, you know, uh, we think make an internet a better place. So, so, uh, we, we have a pretty large team on our side that is trying to make sure that this works. Um, then um, kind of where we are going. Uh, so this is also, I actually got invited by this to, to this talk by Mark Tinka here uh, after an incident about two weeks ago in South Africa, um, which I will try to address a little bit here. Um, so a couple of the things that we are looking for and what we think would make things better is that we are definitely moving into a delegated RPK solution. Uh, there's already uh, traces of this kind of in the global uh, global scene of RPKI right now. So we already have test delegations out. Uh, we will run this on AWS infrastructure uh, in many regions. So it will be, uh, you know, uh, a multi-tenant, uh, uh, a multi multi uh, multi geographic build uh, that we think will be pretty cool. We will use our own CDN for publication as well. So. So we are kind of striving on making sure that this becomes one of the best RPKI, delegated RPKI solutions there is available. Um, this is also make it easier for us to automate against the, um, the, 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 um, the top level CAs. So we don't have need different ones for Aaron, Ripe, Afronic, Apinic. Uh, so we have one universal um, interface towards our customers, which is our, the ones that build services in LBS. So they don't need to interact with different ones. Uh, we have something called a bring your own IP, which means that you essentially bring your own IP addresses into the cloud and build your services. Um, this is today supported and we, RPKI ROAS is 100% uh, enforced in this situation. Uh, the process today is not great. Um, it is absolutely doable, but it does require some, some weird things where you put the X509 certificates in kind of the remarks of the route objects. Uh, and this is not great. So we are absolutely, so we are looking for ratification of either RC or RTA, which is uh, up and coming standards in the ITF, which we are super interested in and we think will, will help us solve this problem. Uh, we're also working out that, and probably a few one in this chat uh, has already got an email from us that once that actually has RPKI invalids, we're trying to get this number to zero. It will probably be hard. Uh, but um, we, we are reaching out to the ones that have a large amount of invalids, just informing them that, you know, we are blocking these from every single type of peer, transit or peer alike. So if we, we are not going to be able to send uh, traffic to that prefix if they are RPK invalid. And, and this is typically the question that you get from other operators is like, hey, how much did you, how much uh, churn did you get out of this, turning it on globally? Um, and, and um, actually not that much. Uh, it was four, I believe we had 14 incidents 
where where some people just couldn't reach our services at a time when we turned this on last year. And all of them were sold just by making sure that the row was correct. We didn't put in any, um, you know, slurm on the side or anything like that. Um, so we are uh, on point four, we want to continue to work on community projects such as Manners uh, to launch initiatives, but also being here, right? Being on conferences, reaching out, making sure that people understand what we're doing and, and uh, try to help as much as possible for others that want to do it. Um, we would uh, also help RIRs improve where needed. We, we are a big user of our PKI ecosystem uh, in general. Like we pull things frequently. We also publish ROAS probably in a bigger sense than most others. So, so we are more than happy to help all RIRs um, work with this correctly. Uh, and so that we build this for the future and not just something that's built for today, right? So we want this to, to function in 10 years as well. Um, and then point six is we need to revisit IR filtering um, and, and something better of it. Today, kind of how we look at IR filtering is uh, that we deny things on all peers. Um, which means that we, we take away things that we don't want to see. And today, this is kind of limited to, for example, T1 networks or other big peers, stuff like that. But I would like us to slowly move into something that just allow a specific subset, which is kind of what you would believe is a common theory. But for us, it doesn't really work at scale. So we need to wrap our brains kind of around uh, how to do this at a sensible scale, because we have, we have a lot of routers and a lot of peers. And, and uh, doing this the regular way is not going to work. So we need something else. And the last. Hi, Frederick. Uh, yes, for sure. Just to come in there, I just want to alert you to time. You've got five minutes until QA. Yes. Yeah, I see we have a couple of questions as well. So we'll take that in the end. So uh, prefix limits, which is the last part, which is actually something that would have helped out with this outage the 9th of September, is that today we, we do set prefix limits on every pair. Uh, we have a couple of buckets, like a, like a prefix limit of 1,000, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 prefixes. Uh, most likely, this needs to be uh, set much closer, uh, preferably something around the peering DB limit plus 5% or something like that. Um, it is causing a lot of churn. Uh, we had that before, and typically our routers were busy doing that config change uh, a, few, a few hours per day. Uh, especially in combination with our, our, our filtering, which can make a, a router commit take 30 to an hour, 30 minutes to an hour. And if we want to touch the router all the time, uh, setting prefix limits up and down, maybe it's not the best thing. So we need to be smart around that as well um, to make sure that we don't see that type of impact that we had in South Africa the 9th of September. Um, I did answer a lot of the questions. So I was invited to this by Mark. Uh, the, the outage of the 9th of September, it was basically someone announcing us 175,000 uh, prefixes. We blocked 169,000 of those uh, because of our PKI or IR filtering, but a few of them then got through. Um, and unfortunately that impacted some of the people on, on the Nav Africa platform that couldn't reach our prefixes because this ISP just didn't route it. So the problem was there that uh, they, they uh, um, de-aggregated a lot of the prefixes um, towards us, unfortunately, uh, but they kept the origin intact, which means that our PKI doesn't really work because uh, our PKI has no, uh, doesn't understand path, right? So uh, since the origin was intact, it was probably, it was probably the work of, uh, it, to me, it looked like uh, it was the work of a BGP optimizer that keeps the origin intact, but um, makes the previous much shorter. So. Uh, so anything about this, send it directly to me. I, we have Jorgen here as well, uh, somewhere in the audience, uh, the virtual audience that uh, happy to answer kind of Africa parent questions. You can either send directly to Jorgen or sending to our EMEA alias, I'm part of the EMEA alias too. And technical operations goes to parent.to and uh, let's ask you some questions. Marcia, do you want to, to me to take them up directly from the chat or how do you want to do it? Uh, no, I will, I will post them. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. That was very, very interesting. Um, I'm sure we've got uh, quite a few people that would like to, to speak. So um, let me quickly go to the hands. Okay, I see the hands are gone, but I'm going to do ask the questions that are in the Q&A. So the first question, uh, it comes from Paul Walner. He says, do you allow IP addresses allocated by all registrars to be brought into your environment? 
Yes. Uh, yeah. So I see Graham essentially has the same um, uh, the same questions as well. So I'll answer both of them. Uh, as far as I know, Afronic uh, is not supported today for bring our own IP uh, solutions. One of the ways we would like to solve it is by um, doing a delegation on our own so that we create a CA uh, uh, that is under Afronic and then people that can move around. Uh, I am not the person that is that is that has exactly all the answers on all the politics and, and rules and policy in place for that. Uh, but I'm more than happy to kind of bring it to the team and uh, we can see what's needed for for. Uh, how to do this with Afronic. Uh, but today it is supported by Apinic, uh, Ripe, and Iron for sure. Okay. I'm um, going to go into the next question, which is by Douglas Fisher. And he asks about relationship between ASNs and the AS cones. How, how AWS deals with that? How does AWS look into import export RPLs routing policies? I guess the easy answer there is nothing, because uh, there really isn't anything we can do. Um, the, 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 the documentation accuracy in RPSL is just not good enough to be able to use for anything. Since we have no, idea, no possibility to kind of handle uh, peers individually, like we, we, we peer with essentially any network on the planet, right? So uh, it needs to be something that is that is globally scalable and RPSL policies is not that. I know there are some networks that are really good at document export import policies and everything is there. It's great. Like please continue to do that. It does it does help a human that is troubleshooting a problem to understand that too. Uh, but from a kind of looking at it from the ways of a machine or a computer, I don't see I don't see anything we can do about that. However, if we, for example, can get RPKI ASPA uh, off the ground, then there is at least a, a, a scientifically correct and cryptographically signed way of expressing an AS cone or, 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 or that type of method, which I think would be great. I guess my time is up and I see no open questions. So I'd like to hand it over to the next speaker. Thanks. Uh, you still do have a bit of time. So I'm oh, really? just going to quickly check. Um, yes. <laughs> there was a hand that was up before, but uh, he seems to have put his hand down. Uh, Bill, if you still need to ask the question, please raise your hand or we can move on from there. Okay. Um, the poll is up. If you could please rate Frederick's um, presentation, we'll definitely appreciate that. Frederick, thank you so much for your time and thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, actually, there is a question here. This is a last oh, one from Douglas there Fisher. <laughs> Looking yes. last for AWS regions, can we fish for that? Can we wish for that? You can wish all you want. Uh, uh, we, I think a looking glass, we have been discussing that for about 15 years or something like that. Uh, there is no public looking glass. There is an internal looking glass. And uh, I worked here for two and a half years and I'm still confused exactly what's happening. Um, so if you would like a looking glass, I would strongly suggest to use the ML Nog ring, um, which we have boxes in every single region. Um, or at least all the all the um, all the all the regions that was launched up to last year. Uh, so there is regular Unix-based boxes you can use for trace routes um, there. Uh, a regular looking glass. I it will simply be too complex to kind of gather any questions about uh, to kind of get an understanding of how it would look like. Uh, our network doesn't really operate like like a regular network does. We have many many layers of things that's happening on on many different. Um, uh, occasions we don't really use all the routing protocols you would assume that we use for routing um, so uh, that's why we don't offer it publicly and and, and almost not even internally uh, but a unix based box that has trace route and ping that is kind of the best we can do and uh, yeah i would suggest to join the analog ring so you get access to that extremely good tool it's probably one of the best troubleshooting tools on the planet i would say and uh, yeah, I'm available on the Telegram, Sono groups as well. If anyone would like to have some uh, kind of off the off the record questions there, so I'm more than happy to answer over there. All right, thank, thank you very much. Thank you so much again, Frederick. I guess that will be all the questions. Thank you once again. Thank you. Okay, so uh, for our next session, uh, we have the peering personals. Um, if you could please have that slide up. So I'd like to introduce Noah Miner, who will be taking over for the next session. Uh, we will have peering personals and our peering personals are sponsored by Inkzeda, 
and links. Thank you so much for your, for your support and for um, sponsoring the Peering Personals. Um, Noah, I'm gonna hand over to you. Yeah, hi, Portia. Thank you so much. Um, okay, are you able thank to see you. Me? I can see you. Okay. All right, so um, the slides are up, I guess. Uh, no. Should I share them? All right, I'll share the slides. Yes, please share. Yep. We good? Yes. All right, thank you. Um, so for this uh, specific part of the session, I will uh, kindly ask for aid, Michelle Opio, uh, Francis Kiranga, uh, Frank Habich, Wycliffe Momani, and Simon Mayoye to perhaps unmute their mics. And yeah, so this session will be basically about peering personals. Um, as you all know, of course, the peering ecosystem uh, in Africa has, you know, uh, changed the African internet trajectory in the last 20 years. Um, we can proudly say that today, most of the traffic in Africa is actually being routed within the continent. And uh, that is something we should be proud of. And some of the players involved in this ecosystem will be basically presenting, um, you know, information about their different peering, uh, you know, uh, strategies and the locations where they peer. So I'll start with Ed for the first slide. Um, Ed, um, can you hear me? Yep, hi there, I'm here. Yeah. Right, um, uh, I'm Ed, uh, the, one of the speakers from earlier. Um, we run Dinks, Sinks, and Jinx. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned earlier also, we're the oldest um, exchange in, in the continent. Um, we've been around for 25 years. We operate multiple facilities in uh, Durban, Johannesburg, and Cape Town um, in pretty much all of the major data centers. Uh, we're always open to extend to other data centers uh, within the same uh, uh, metropolitan region. Um, so yeah, uh, we give, uh, we're a community run IX um, with a community voted for uh, committee. Uh, so we basically listen to your needs and you tell us what you want and we generally make it happen where financially and technically feasible. Uh, so yeah, please come and join with us pairing um, and yeah. Thank you, Ed. Um, uh, Portia, I think you will need to support me a bit since we're host to unmute um, sure my thing. panel. Yeah, so if you can unmute Michelle, Francis Kiranga, Frank Habich, Wycliffe, and Simon. Sure thing. Michelle, if you're unmuted, you're up next. Good, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle from Walk Online. Um, Walk Online is a global IP transit um, provider. Our AS is 37271. We have a selective peering policy. We're located in NAP Africa, um, all the NAP Africas, all the INX um, exchanges as well in South Africa. We're in KXP, Kenya. AMSEX in Amsterdam, Equinix in Singapore, DKX uh, Frankfurt, France IX in Marseille, we had links as well, LON1 and LON2, as well as LONUP. If you want more information about our routing policy and our peering policy, you can find that on as37271.fyi, where you can get um, our routing policy, peering policy, as well as a look at our looking glass, where you can find out um, where it would be beneficial to peer from. You can contact us at peering at workonline.africa. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, can I have Francis next? Francis from Africa. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Francis from Africa, and uh, we have three ASNs basically. Uh, the first ASN is uh, for our internal uh, Afrinic services that we offer outside. That is, uh, for example, my Afrinic, who is IRR, RPKI, and all that. Uh, the second two 
uh, yes, uh, for our DNS uh, programs and uh, any cast services that we offer within the region. So we have an open peering policy. Uh, we peer with anyone, and uh, our peering locations are in Sings, Dings, Jings, Tings, Rings, and uh, also the Tunisia Internet Exchange points. So you can reach us out at uh, peering at afrinic.net. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Um, next will be Frank Habich. Frank, you're there? Is Frank there? Uh, help Frank unmute, because I think he's saying he's unable to unmute. Oh, OK. Thank you. Thank you. I'm back. All right. Go ahead, Frank. Uh, Frank? Porsche, is there a problem with Frank or? No, uh, his mic is unmuted. Maybe let's come back to him. Okay, we'll come back to Frank. Um, Wycliffe? Yeah, sure, thank you. Uh, hope I'm audible. Yep. Yeah, sure, thanks. Uh, yeah, so this is Wyok, our West Indian Ocean Cable Company. We are basically an IP transit and uh, our AS is uh, 37662. We actually have uh, several peering uh, locations as um, indicated here. We, have, we are present in uh, NAP Africa, JNB that is in Cape Town and uh, Durban. We are Jinx that is Djibouti Exchange, KXP. Uh, the next, um, that is a uh, Nigeria Internet Exchange Point. We also present there, the D6, uh, France IX, Lynx, NLIX. Uh, in Marseille and uh, in London as well. So um, if you need more information on that, you can always uh, get us on uh, the peering DB. We have um, a lot in there. You can, if you need to perhaps make a peering request or something, you can always contact us at uh, peering at yoc.net as well. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Aiki. Um... Simon. Hey, hi, uh, Simon Mayer here from SICOM, um, AS37100. So peering policy selective, uh, it can be, uh, the, 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 the policy can be read on AS37100.net and also on peering DB. So the locations where we are, NAP Africa, that is Cape Town, Joburg and Durban. Uh, we are Jigs, Sinks and Dinks. TIX, KXP, UIXP, uh, we had M6, uh, DKX. Uh, we missed something here, which is uh, EKX, uh, then France IX, Lynx, and NLIX. So our contact uh, is written uh, appearing at sequel.com and you can be able to, to be responded uh, the shortest time in case of an inquiry. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. I'll go back to Frank. Uh, Frank, are you there? Okay, I'll take this up for Frank. So um, SimbaNet, basically, it's part of Wanainti Group. Um, their AS is 37084. They have an open peering policy, and um, they currently operate within Tanzania at the Tanzania Internet Exchange Point in Dar es Salaam, in Arusha at the IIA, IIA, um, AIXP, in Dodoma at the DIXP, and in Mwanza um, at the Mwanza MIXP. So to reach out to SimbaNet, if you need to peer with them, um, you can basically contact them at peering at simbanet.net. And some of the information is also available on peering DB if you can look up their AS number. So for today, those are the players within the peering ecosystem in Africa who we've managed to contact and have on the webinar today. Um, tomorrow we'll have more, um, you know, uh, players in, within the, the peering ecosystem. And therefore, please take note of their contacts and reach out to them in case you need to peer with them. Thank you so much. And I'll hand over the um, floor back to Portia.
Thank you so much, Noah. Yes. That was a great peering session. We had quite a number of people. I did not expect that many number. So well done to everybody. And um, once again, we'd like to say a big thank you to our speakers today. Uh, today's program would not have been possible without you. We truly appreciate your time and, and your efforts uh, into making SAFNAG a successful meeting. Um, we'd like to also just say thank you once again to our sponsors. Our platinum sponsors are Akamai, Flex Optics, Team Camry, and then our gold sponsors are Africa Data Centers, ICANN, Internet Society, Work Online. And of course, our appearing sponsors are Inc. ZA, Link, and our community sponsor is NAP Africa. Thank you for your support. We truly appreciate it. So um, for tomorrow, uh, this was our first day, and tomorrow we'll have the next meeting. But um, please feel free to, uh, to connect with us. Our website is safnoc.org, uh, where you'll be able to access all the slides for, um, for today's presentation, as well as find more details regarding tomorrow's meeting. Please also join our mailing list. The details is on the, is on the screen. Um, you can also find the, de the details on the website. Please connect with us via Twitter and, um, and as well as uh, Instagram at Safnog, um, it should be easy to find. So please feel free to retweet um, anything that's happening during the conference or uh, just, just connect with us. Thank you so much once again, and we look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow uh, for day two of, Saf of Safnog 6. We have an exciting agenda lined up with our keynote speaker who is Eddie Kayuru from Afrinic. So we're looking forward to seeing you guys again tomorrow. And thank you for joining SAFMAT 6, day one.